Welcome to this month's episode of Short Clip Case Studies, brought to you by Natera Performance Solutions. In this video, I'll be looking at long-term power training for a sprint hurdler, specifically two training interventions, which first closed a displacement gap, and then looking at using quarter squats, what its planning, results, and limitations were. When designing all my training cycles, I always practice the guiding methods labeled on this page. The selection of proven exercises and progression strategies, as well as actively reviewing changes between training blocks, really helped me in making power training effective for supporting long-term sporting performance. The athlete being presented here was a good hurdler developmentally, having been on junior national teams and winning age group events, but as a senior athlete, only having modest PBs in the indoor and outdoor hurdle races as of December 2019. Hurdle technique was deemed adequate. The reasons for performance failure was poor acceleration technique and recognizing that the athlete was just generally slow. Hence, for this individual, there was a real interest in using power training to really support those performance changes. For athletes that need to accelerate, there seems to be a general leg of power requirement. When looking at two athletes that are able to run under 7 seconds and 60 meters, which indicates good maximum speed and good acceleration qualities, they seem to hit a similar mark on the counter movement jump flight time and peak velocity. Flight times can be assessed using a slow motion camera, while a push accelerometer was used to evaluate peak velocities for these two athletes. A 735 millisecond in the flight time and a 3.85 meters per second in the peak velocity are, are marks that I believe in for people that need to accelerate really quickly. The qualities indicated by those counter movement jump performances then become the working goals for this athlete in SPP and CP, the specific and competition phase. For this athlete, there's always an upwards trend in leg power correlated with 60 meter hurdle race performance. What happens when training allows for that achievement of that 3.84 peak velocity? For this athlete, acceleration development always goes from short to long focus. From September to March, runs first start off with 10 meters and then move gradually towards 50 meters. Though there were massive improvements in acceleration rate this year, indicated by 0 to 30 meter free lap times, 30 to 50 meters times were poor and well below 10 meters per second. Alongside resolving poor acceleration technique, which was responsible for creating the velocity plateau, I suspect that physically ineffective work had been done around the knee dominant position, which held back 30 to 50 meter times, since at higher speeds, there is an increasing importance of applying vertical forces. Additionally, looking at a picture of the athlete's PB back squat around 2.1 times body weight indicates a very hip dominant squat, which further supports ineffective work around the knee extensors. This suggests that work in the specific and competition phase should consist of strength and power work in upright positions. When assessing leg qualities, one can't just look at counter movement jump height and power, but also needs to consider reactivity around the knee and ankles, aka stiffness. Here, a much faster 7.6 second athlete is compared with the slower 8.0 athlete in a pogo jump. Both athletes check the box for short ground contact times, which makes sense as hurdling is an even shorter time activity than sprinting. The goal then for this athlete isn't just to have great stiffness levels, but to achieve what strength coach Joseph Coyne calls maximum displacement at set contact times. So not just looking at being able to achieve a very short contact time on the ground, but looking at how far they can actually displace vertically, horizontally, or a mix of both while maintaining that set contact time. For this athlete who's shown great stiffness levels, but insufficient leg power levels and having poor acceleration, I concluded that knee extensor ability needed to be developed from SPP to CP. The reliance in performance for this athlete was achieving greater flight times or achieving greater displacement levels, and hence there was a need to close that displacement gap. When sequencing training cycles of strength and explosive strength, I used the bottom right figure to guide my exercise selection for power training. Large time value exercises like traditional strength work transform into expression of strength in competition-like time frames. Right before the entry into the indoor competition period and around December time, the high time value exercise was a very heavy single leg isometric mid-thigh pull. Around 250 to 260 kilos loaded up on a bar and aiming for the athlete to lift it off the spotter arms. After filling in the strength bucket in late SPP, competition time calls for a set of power exercises that can do two things. One is still being able to productively develop knee extensor qualities, and number two is meeting those freshening demands that have low physical and psychological costs when weekly competitions are happening. This need for freshening creates my preference for flat loading. In this cycle, the end stage progression for time frame specificity and overload become a loaded technical exercise such as the vested block start here on the page that develops both physical and technical qualities. 
Since this athlete's particular weaknesses were being average in displacements, I had to bring in Intervention 1, Anti-Gravity, which was developing the ability to own the ground and to get off of it. Jumps are always my preference during competition time. They're not very fatiguing, they require little setup time, and they can also be conveniently tracked with accelerometers. Two exercises shown here are a very heavy squat jump and an ankle bound. The idea was to use additional loading rather than just body weight to really develop those propulsive abilities around the primary extensors. The athlete's previous focus on hurdle hops, drop jumps, depth jumps were now traded in for loaded jumps. The concentration here was really developing those knee and ankle extensors, which we know have a major role in resisting the initial part of ground contact. These exercises, I intuited, were minimally effective for furthering stiffness levels, which the athlete no longer needed, but it did meet the criteria of developing displacement abilities, which the athlete was reliant on for further performance success. And they were especially appropriate during competition time when the criteria of freshening was very important. This program lasted six weeks using a flat loading system, the very unique Dr. Bonacek system. The power training was always done after the technical training on the same day. It's noteworthy how easy the power sessions were and how short they were, which contributed immensely to resolving technical issues, as the athlete was always in a high state of physical readiness. Here were the daily counter movement jump changes, always done for six reps before the start of the technical training session. It's worth noting that on January 21st, the athlete reported the best technical session to date. Seeing that the session had high counter movement jump peak velocity values, this supports a positive correlation between hurdle acceleration and physical jumping. Here are the specific changes in training velocities with 160 pound repeat squat jump. Again, the shaded dates on January 21st is when the athlete reports best feeling in hurdle technical session. This shows a connection between technical and physical training exercises. After six weeks of developing the anti-gravity abilities, a 0.22 meters per second velocity improvement came in the counter movement jump. Also, as a really good indicator of good periodization design, that physical peak and that counter movement jump arrived five days out before the final competition of the season. The competition performance was an 11 millisecond improvement in 60 meter hurdle race performance from the season opener, as well as a significant 16 millisecond improvement from the previous year. Tabled here are the long-term changes from 2018 to 2020 in jump velocities, just jump mat flight times, and also loaded exercises like a 40 kilogram jump, which is around 50% body mass. The trend of growing displacement abilities shown in the 2020 indoor season, as well as since 2018, partly confirms my insistence on closing the displacement gap. It is very useful for the sprint hurdler. Lesson learned. Training adaptations that included better counter movement jump velocities likely helps with running power in the sprint hurdles. Displacement matters. However, when reviewing performance change, though there was a fairly good growth in average velocity when looking at the heavy jump squat numbers using the push, improving from 1.66 to 1.72 from the first session to the peak in average velocity, but when looking at day max and peak velocity, I noticed that there was very little improvement, only going from 2.67 to 2.69 on the peak velocity. A slight disclaimer, I'm cautious of the data being presented here as it might have looked at the wrong places or there might be reliability issues that I don't know. But my intuition, combined with the athlete report, feeling that the squat jump was too too heavy, pushed me towards a reading that the next training cycle really needed to focus on exercises that would focus on developing peak velocity. So far, this is just a gut feeling. but. I really interpret this to be a case that the heavy repeated squat jump did a really good job in transferring well to low velocity, but not well to high velocity. This suggests an inclusion of ballistics in the next cycle. Kinetic and kinematic analysis of ballistics and strength work show us that different training adaptations are created. Heavier loads allow higher forces to be developed throughout the concentric duration. The more force that is applied to overcome the system load, the greater the movement velocity, hence greater adaptations to mean velocities. While peak velocity is all about creating greater accelerations, the lighter the load, the greater the possible acceleration. Also another adaptation might be developing the antagonist's eccentric power so that the agonist can develop work over a longer period of time. I've also heard the strength coach Caldeets talk about athletes being powerful at different points, either being very fast out of the hole or having a lot of snap at the end. Researchers and practitioners here encourage my belief that different ranges and velocities should and can be targeted within training. If you're looking for proven ballistic exercises, the easiest way is to borrow a long jump coach's library. For example, Randy Huntington. Here's an example of all the strength and power exercises he might use. When it comes to strength and power, Randy is famous in his use of Kaiser pneumatic machines to really minimize that deceleration around takeoff. This training cycle comes nine months after intervention one. It's a planned training cycle that's supposed to come right before competition season that didn't happen because of COVID-19. Just like Intervention 1, the developmental focus was technical and physical ability of hurdle acceleration, so to prepare for 60 meter hurdle racing. 
Again, technical training precedes power training on the same day. The organization of training elements within the week focuses on three items to really maximize technical and physical qualities. Since power and technical training both require high preparedness, they are placed at the beginning of the microcycle when the athlete is most fresh. Unlike intervention one, this training cycle is almost three months away from the primary competition period. Therefore, low velocity strength is still done and is therefore kept in at the end of the week. Hurdle speed is usually a high priority item for a competitive hurdler, but the demands for it are low in early SVP and therefore they're also placed at the end of the week with low velocity strength exercises. The exercises here are really embracing that light load ballistic strength which I determined to be an opportunity for adaptation. They're done primarily around specific running ranges of motion such as the takeoff. The goal is really pushing off every last inch of range of motion and aiming for high limb velocities. They were done in PAP clusters which stands for post activation potentiation which is another board modality from Randy which he calls triads. The clusters consist of a complex progression that goes slow, fast, medium, which aims to first develop force and then velocity separately, and then combining it in one exercise at the end. The goal is surfing the force velocity curve with skill-specific exercises. Every non-technical training exercise in Intervention 2 becomes fast, with the goal of working the strength curve around takeoff in every way possible. Exercises like the hang clean utilize biofeedback through the push band to make them go faster. Slower exercises like 20 centimeter heavy step ups were still done, but the goal was to move everything towards speed. The result of the ballistic training cycle, which lasted three to four weeks, was increased counter movement jump peak velocities far beyond the previous average. What's shaded on the right is the jumps measured after the four weeks of training. Every jump done after the focus on ballistics is higher than the highest jump achieved before, with the PR being 394 there also seemed to be a very strong transference to the competitive exercise for this athlete. The first day that this athlete trains over two hurdles in practice, a PB to hurdle three was matched. Though it's not a direct comparison because surface, wind conditions, and there were slight changes to spacing and height of hurdle one. But I think the close proximity between that push counter movement jump PB on November 21st and November 30th, where that PB to hurdle three was matched, I think illustrates near PB form in early stages because of that higher physical condition. However, when we look at counter movement jump tracking from the two different periods, though there were increased peak velocities far beyond the previous average, we have to understand that peak and takeoff velocities aren't the same. Higher peak velocities do not necessarily mean greater takeoff velocities. Although peak velocities were higher, flight times are actually below average. Here are videos from the two different training periods. The video on the right is the aforementioned great technical training session which came with above average peak velocities and near PB flight times. The jump on the left is in late November, nearing the end of the ballistic training cycle. Although the jumps featured super PB peak velocities, when looking at the jumps using a slow-mo camera in this period, I found below average flight times. The discrepancy between takeoff and peak velocity, I believe, might have been a lesson in getting too specific. Knee extensors are, as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, highly involved with early acceleration. Even a half Bulgarian squat, which looks similar to acceleration, does not, in my opinion, help with initial steps. Was removing full range strength exercises a good move for an athlete who needs to get out of a low position? When rating his own running to hurdle 1, the athlete rated a much higher performance in the period right around intervention 1. This was when full range strength exercises such as full squatting was done. I believe the acceleration of hurdle 1, indicated by coach and athlete rating as being subpar, as well as being supported by physical measures such as lower counter movement jump flight times, was because of 90 to 120 degree strength exercises were removed. Removing full range strength exercises was a major misdealing that did not help support greater acceleration hurdle 1 which was the most urgent quality to develop in early SPP. Maybe the lesson is to just do your squats. Early acceleration rate is important for the sprinter and hurdler. A periodization of model of squatting in GPP and then later quarter squatting in SPP exists and it might work, but don't get specific for specificity's sake. Since the 90 degree squatting exercise is still specific for a sprinter who needs to come out of blocks, being hyper-focused on one form of general strength might be short-sighted. I believe you need to keep 90 degree squatting as long as possible in the yearly plan. Here is an overview for the long-term power training for the sprint hurdler. The two different physical interventions presented here are born from the athlete's specific weaknesses. Poor displacement abilities called for heavy squat jumps. That proved to be effective for 6 meter hurdle running. Seeing ballistics being an untapped area called for its inclusion, perhaps excessive inclusion, in the physical training program. That seemed to help hurdle 3 performance when the athlete is more upright. This shows us that to sequence long-term power training, exercise selection is very important. Since you get strong at different points, you really need to pay attention attention to exercises you've done because they tell you where future potential adaptation might lie. 
Just like powerlifters who are aware of different exercises to train the top or the bottom of the bench press, running coaches can do the same with different ranges of motions and velocities. A lesson learned from the discrepancy between takeoff and peak velocity is that power training in your program needs to be balanced and needs to cover what is needed in sport. Hint, that's a lot of qualities, even for a sprint hurdler who only does one thing. Remember, be guided by adaptation opportunities, the things that you haven't done, the things you haven't adapted to, but be wary of removing those other qualities wholesale because you never know what you might be missing. Balanced implementation is being able to fit in new exercises that are indicated from previous training cycles and to be able to add them in to coexist with proven exercises such as full squatting and not wholesale replacing them. I now understand balanced implementation. Every effective long-term power training program, I argue, should contend with block potentiation, ongoing assessments, and recognition of individual profile changes, as well as constantly reviewing past training blocks and looking ahead. Carefully utilizing these methods will surely help prevent training plateaus when it comes to any power development program. <laughs>